Wait, are you trying to get a video of him? Hi, welcome to Skullworthy. I'm Matt. I'm Tiffany. And today we're talking about Michael Wayne McGray. So some fast facts about Michael Wayne McGray. He was convicted of killing seven, but he may have killed 18 or more. He was born on July 11th in 1965. His murders took place between 1985 and 1998, and stabbing and strangulation was his preferred murder method. You said that he had killed seven people for sure, but he may have had up to 18? When he was arrested, he claimed to have more victims. A lot of times when you see that variance with them, it's that they're, we know they killed some, and in this case specifically, we were just counting the ones that were convicted. So he was convicted of seven murders, and he claimed to have committed more all over Canada and there was one in particular instance where he told investigators that he had killed somebody and buried them in a certain place and they did a really thorough search and never found any uh, evidence of that um, burial site that he claimed existed. So he just claimed more than I think he was convicted of. So his early life was kind of typical as a serial killer or at least according to him. He claims to have had a hard childhood he claims to have been beaten by his father, who was also an alcoholic, um, and he also claimed to be a victim of sexual abuse after having been taken from his father and bounced around from reform home to reform home. That's something that, I, that we seem to be hearing some about, is that there might be some creepy people in these places. Now, this was claims that he made. I don't think these were ever necessarily confirmed. Of course, when a serial killer starts killing, they're more concerned about their murders than they are their childhood. Reform homes. Uh, they seem to produce a lot of killers. I, I'm not prepared with enough data to speak on that specifically, but it does seem that that is the case. There's a lot of stories of different kinds of abuse that come out of those places, and I don't know what it is about that. Maybe it's just opportunity. I mean, because those places have a lot of kids going through them. Uh, they, they're they not necessarily the and they still best have kids them, of society. They're, still around, they're the problem right? children, and I don't want to say that because I feel like that's, you know, but... Uh, they There's opportunity, and if somebody wanted to be in there and pretend for all the adults that they were a good person long enough to get alone with kids, I think that, that that environment produces really bad opportunities for that. But they still, so, the, these homes are still around, correct? Or incorrect? Yeah, I would guess that in modern times they may have become aware of this and maybe they're having multiple adults. The only experience I had was I actually lifeguarded for one of these uh, places one time and everything seemed good to me, but they did have multiple people. So I think that's one of the best ways to combat that is that if you have a bad apple and you have multiple people in there, it, it helps the awareness of what's going on rather than just having one person that has all of the say-so over everything. So I would guess that they've probably tried to take some precautions, but yes, those homes still exist, and mm. it's very likely that they're still not the places you want to live as a child. He also claimed to have enjoyed animal abuse as a child. That's also pretty common with serial killers. He said that as an adult, he felt a strong urge to murder. He was fond of animal abuse, and we know, I know that we learned in school the McDonald triad, but it's been largely disproven at this point. But I think it still is a good indicator because so many of them have this. And the three things are animal abuse, arson, and uh, wetting the bed past a certain age. Mm -hmm. um, and he had animal abuse. But did it say anything about arson? I know it's not always common to no, list. No, it was just animal wetting abuse. Wetting the bed. But um, get this. McGray claimed to have been controlled by murderous demons that drove him to his insidious acts. After being arrested, he requested mental health treatment and was granted that request. He was assessed by multiple psychiatrists and interestingly enough, one of the psychiatrists identified McGray as having a rare form of Tourette's syndrome that made him unable to control his impulse to murder. Tourette's gives the impulses, but I've never heard of it giving impulses to they, kill. Well, what the psychiatrist said was that it, it made it made him unable to control the impulse to kill. So it's like the impulse to kill was there, but 
he also had a rare form of Tourette's that mm. inhibited his ability to stop that. Now, I again, what are your? That's kind of one thing I wanted to bring up to you. What are your thoughts on that? Well, my thought was when you said the murderous demons. My first thought was, you know, he's playing to the court as a mental health mm-hmm. disability. Me that was my first thought, and it's like, oh, I, I didn't mean it. I have mental issues, which is garbage most of the time. Then he was diagnosed with this Tourette's, but, it, it I mean, as you were saying, it's not telling why he's got the urge. It's just yeah, well, describing why he goes through it with it. Yeah, I don't know. I think that... Even, like you said, if the McDonald triad has been disproven, it kind of throws out some of the knowledge that we were operating on previously in the criminal justice system. And it makes us kind of open up and broaden our spectrum to realizing that serial killers can be something different than just somebody that wet the bed or tortured animals. Yeah. You, you might have one of those markers, or in some cases, you might not have any. And I'm sure That's that as true. we continue to do this, we'll, we'll come up with some interesting examples of Maybe maybe a serial killer that had none of those indications. Well, and also, if you just like to play with fire and maybe you wet the bed too long, doesn't mean you're going to end up being a killer well, either. His crimes started in 1985 when he committed his first murder. It was May 1st in 1985 when he picked up a hitchhiker named Elizabeth Tucker. In 1985, was it normal to hitchhike? I mean, I would imagine that nobody in today's world would i think it was then though that's not true somebody there are still people that hitchhike but um just a female on their own what did it's it was never advisable for a female to do that i think it is kind of hard to believe because it seems like not a smart thing to do but you know people do things sometimes without thinking then two years later in 1987 he claimed another victim named mark gibbons Mark was his accomplice in a robbery of a taxi driver in St. John. Surprisingly, he wasn't formally charged with this murder. Mm -hmm. In 1991, while serving time for his robbery of a taxi driver, he killed two men named Robert Astley and Gayton Ether. He met them at Montreal's Gay Village while on a three-day break from prison. They gave him a break from prison. Does, I don't, do, do we get breaks from prison in America? Is this just a Canadian thing? Did I mention that? This was all in Canada. After meeting in the village, Robert invited McGray back to his room. Once there, McGray fatally stabbed Robert. Just one day later, he returned to the gay village and met Gayton Ether, who also invited him back to his room. He fatally stabbed Ether after spending the night with him, but he only confessed to these murders after being arrested for murdering Joan Hicks and her 11-year-old daughter, Nina Hicks, on February 28, 1998, in New Brunswick. The majority of these people you said were stabbed? Yeah, they were. He was... He. It said that he liked to strangle or stab, but every it seemed like most of the information that I was getting, it it seemed that he was um, stabbing. And there was another victim that he hadn't, it wasn't actually confirmed that it was him, but they think it was him, and she was found with her throat cut. So he, it seemed like he was a fan of the knife work. Um, his, I don't think uh, I mentioned this, but the um, the guy that he killed in the process of uh, robbing the taxi driver. There were two accomplices. He killed one. The one he killed was found stabbed to death by police when they arrived at the scene. So he killed the guy right at the scene, and and, and that was by stabbing. So most of the information that I was finding on this guy, it was knife. In 2000, he pleaded guilty to killing Joan Hicks, but denied the murder of Nina, her daughter. So he did end up pleading guilty to killing the mom, the mom and daughter duo, but the, he only pleaded to the mom. Yeah, I find that puzzling. Maybe he didn't want to see himself as a child killer. Mm. Maybe it was one of those things. He wouldn't do well in prison if he was convicted that, on that. You know, that could that could have been it because he spent a whole lot of his life in and out of prison. And maybe it was just, I don't want them to look at me like that. So I'll admit to this one, but I'll deny the other one. But they were very, they seemed very, very sure that he did kill both of them, so... Why, I mean, if they were killed together... And in the same way... In the same way, I don't think there's any doubt that if he did one, he did the other. Yeah. I mean, unless he had somebody with him, which I highly doubt 
In 2010, while serving life sentences for the murder of Joan Hicks and Nina Hicks, he murdered a fellow inmate named Jeremy Phillips. Before murdering Phillips, McGray was eligible for parole after serving life sentences for his previous murders. After committing the murder of Jeremy Phillips, he's been isolated in one of Canada's most secure prisons and no longer has the possibility of parole. His cellmate, Jeremy Phillips, you said that he killed his cellmate. He did, and um, he... The funny thing about that one, not funny at all really, but the, the, the crazy thing is that he requested to be moved there from where they were to a different block. He didn't even want to be in the same block as this guy. And um, Instead, they put him in a cell together. <laughs> yeah, they, he ended up in a cell with this guy. And other thing that was really odd about this was after this guy was killed, McGray's story was that Phillips hatched a scheme for them to pretend it was a fake, it was a fake kidnapping or fake hostage situation and he was supposed to uh, let McGray tie him up and take him to the infirmary. And McGray went along with it. And after he was tied up, then he just decided he was going to strangle the guy. And that's how he did that. But that's not really. It was, aw- it was like it was like he was trying to a say. A reason. <laughs> <laughs> it was just such an odd... I found that to be a really odd thing to say at all. And it's not an alibi. Know, it's have, not an excuse. Just an it's odd thing to say. Not any kind of reason that would tell why he would... I mean, to say, like, he was going to make me do something that I didn't want to do, okay. But he didn't even say that. He was just like, eh, I just decided to strangle him anyway. And he was going to be let out before that. Yeah, he was... If, if he served his life sentences for all the other stuff that he had done, he would have been eligible for parole after all of that. But after this happened, after he killed another inmate, that all bets were off. And also as a result of this, um, I don't know what they called him, but their, their coroner, advisor, mm. coroner person, they um, suggested that serial killers not be housed with other inmates. Now, that sounds pretty obvious. A serial killer probably shouldn't be around other people if they're a serial killer. But, yeah, somebody had to die for that to become a thing. But luckily now in Canada, when they house (laughs) serial killers, they get the isolation treatment. So we can keep a close eye on them. (laughs) Okay. Well, so I'm guessing he's in a max security prison now. He is. I I, I can't remember the name. I don't think I could have even pronounced it anyways. It was a weird name. Um, and something, but it's supposed to be the most secure prison in all of Canada. So that is last, last that I had seen that, um, that's where he was. So wow. finally, after killing so many people and telling them that he would kill more, they finally have decided, you know, parole, maybe not a good idea. Maybe he's here. not going to be fixable Yeah. at this point. Well, I mean... He didn't have a type, and that's pretty interesting to me. That is interesting. He just liked to kill. It, he was very unorganized. His opportunity, too, you know. But if but he, if he, I don't know if there was any thought in it or not, but serial killers typically do match a type, and it probably, that he wasn't matching a type, and there was some space between his, his killings, it probably helped him evade capture for as long as he did because the knowledge that we had then about serial murder was that it was only it was there was going to be things that resembled each other but when you have killings that the only real common denominator is that they were stabbed it's not really that much to go off of as an investigator when you don't already have other information so yeah that was interesting and he might have been caught sooner if he had developed a type I mean, it was women, children, young, old. Yeah, the, guys. He, the, the two guys that he killed, that he met in the gay bar um, in Montreal, those two guys were um, one was 45 and the other one was, uh, I think, in the 30s or something like that. So it was, yeah, he, and, he was all over the board with his victims. And you mentioned that one of them. He spent the night with and then killed. He did. But it was did... the second. It was the second guy that he picked up at the Montreal Gay Village. So the they... first one, he just went ahead and did the deed. And as soon as left. soon as they were in the room, apparently, and I don't really know how they know that, but apparently he spent the <laughs> night with the other guy before killing him. So maybe wonder... maybe he had homosexual tendencies too. I, well, I, I mean, know. obviously he was in a gay bar, but that that's well, that, not well, even that could have just been a ruse to get a victim too. It's it could have had been. nothing to do with. 
his sexual preference. But the fact that he spent the night with the guy the second time. Why did like why did he get that extra time to yeah. live and the other one didn't? What was what was the reasoning for that? Was he just wanting a little pleasure before he Maybe he regretted taking the guy the first guy out so quick and wanted to like dang it. Have some fun with the second one. I, I have no idea, but so that's um I think that's pretty much all I have on on this guy and there are there's more information out there available. I just tried to keep it as concise as possible. Pretty interesting either way. Yeah. If you guys like this kind of content, just let us know. Leave comments. Share if you think it's cool. Um, subscribe. Yeah, subscribe. We need really that. Really help us. <laughs> Tell us who you want to see next. Yeah, and if you have any suggestions, that would be totally fine. Drop them in the comments below. We'll, we will probably do it. Yeah. See you next time.